Hello and good morning, everyone. We're very glad you could join us today. My name is Laura Jones and I'm the Northwest Regional Coordinator of the Indiana State Libraries Professional Development Office. I'll be the host and question moderator today for navigating fiscal approval for library boards presented by Kristen McClellan, partner with Ice Miller, Sarah McNeil, Director of Wells County Public Library, and Letitia Provo, Director of Otterbein Public Library. Just a couple of announcements. To register for other webinars or trainings available from our office, please see the Indiana State Library's events calendar, which can be found on our website at www.in.gov backslash library. For a full list of our current in-person training menu, please see our continuing education website. This session is about an hour, so you will receive one LEU for this presentation. If you're watching an archived recording of this webinar, instructions on how to obtain your LEU are in the video's description on YouTube. Or you can find those instructions on the Indiana State Library's continuing education site under LEU policies. Without further ado, I will now turn the presentation over to Kristen, Sarah, and Letitia. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm going to start us off, but before we go to the actual presentation, I kind of wanted to give you a synopsis of why we're here today, why Letitia and Sarah graciously agreed to be co-presenters with me, and that the real reason is that at Ice Miller, um, we have a team of three, Jane Herndon, Eric Long, and myself, that we focus on library construction projects. And for those of you who have been through them, you know that there's a ton of state law issues. We have resolutions, we have hearings, um, there's also some federal law concepts that come into play. But at the end of every single bond issue, we always ask our clients, what do you wish you would have known? And what we hear time and time again is that we wish we would have known more and more quickly about the requirement of elected board approval. So today we're not talking about bond issues specifically, but only one component of those bond issues, and it is elected board approval. And our goal is really to give you some real life situations. We're gonna explain the law, but I'm also gonna have Letitia and Sarah go through specific examples of what they went through in their own districts when they were issuing bonds. So we'll go ahead and get started. And we do look forward to your questions um, at the end of the program. Let me share this. Letitia, Sarah, can you see the screen okay? All right, great. So as you'll see, we're really focusing for you all as leaders in your library districts, we're really focusing on what you need to know during a construction project as it relates to elected board approval. There is a specific statute that says any public entity or municipal entity that has an appointed board must have the approval of an elected fiscal body before bonds can be issued. So let's start with the two key words, which were elected fiscal body and bonds. For those of you who haven't been through a bond issue, when a library wants to do a project and you don't have enough cash in LERF or rainy day to fund it, you have to borrow the money and you borrow it by issuing bonds. So it's much like a mortgage on our homes, but instead of a mortgage, it's bonds that are sold to investors in the public. What's important to know though, from your, where you're sitting right now is that this rule about elected board approval applies to any types of bonds, whether it's for new construction or even for a refunding where you know you can get a better interest rate because rates have dropped, you would think, why would my county council or my city or town council care because I'm getting a better rate? I'm lowering my tax rate but they still care. The statute still requires us, no matter what types of bonds, that we go for elected board approval before a library can issue bonds and construct their project. The other question I get all the time is, 
well, what if I just do a note? What if I don't call it a bond? I call it something else. It doesn't matter what the debt is called. If it's payable from your debt service fund with a property tax levy, we have to have elected board approval before we go forward. What's interesting, and you all know how we love our statutes that govern our libraries, is that this statute really isn't clear on which elected board you will have to go through for the approval of your bond issue. And another thing to note, and we often hear this when we start on a deal, well, I get my, uh, my budget approved by the county, so I'm gonna have to go to the county for approval. The statutes are actually different. Where you go for budget review or budget approval is often different from where you'll go for a bond approval. Again, it could be that you're required to go to the county council for the elected board approval, or your city or town council for the approval to issue bonds. And a lot of that depends upon where the majority of the parcels within your library district are located and which entity originally established your library. So we've tried to summarize this statute in a graph, and I'll be honest, again, this statute isn't always very clear because as um, Letitia especially will tell you, there's a lot of facts in the communities that we don't know about until we get in there. But generally what it is, is if your library is coterminous with your city or town, so you don't have any parcels out in a township of the county, all of your parcels are within the city or town, you will go to the city or town council for bond approval. Additionally, it states that if you are coterminous and you were formed originally by your city or town, again, you will go for city or town council approval. But if you have parcels outside of the city or town you're located in, we have to actually do a parcel count to determine where a majority are so that we can determine if under that first column you go to your county council or if those, there's those crazy facts like that there were in Otterbin where it's a little bit formed by the town, but the majority of the parcels are outside. We have to do a deep dive and a deep analysis. Often we depend on uh, the state library to help us with your formation documents. So as Letitia and Sarah will explain to you, this is why it's so important when you know that a project, you need to have one come underway, or you have a tax rate that will drop, and so you know you need to issue bonds, that you call your bond council right away so we can talk through the facts of your specific situation. So right now, um, we're actually going to stop sharing. And when you get the presentation from Laura, you'll have a summary of what we're going to talk about. But what we really thought would be helpful for you today is to hear some real life stories of how this elected board approval really affected some of our bond issues, how the directors in those libraries overcame some obstacles, sometimes huge obstacles to getting that approval. Um, because as you'll hear, it takes a lot of planning and it's a very political process. So Letitia, our first category is about planning in general. So we'll start off with you and just your recommendations for the other directors. Um, well, yes, as Kristen said, I um, found out that because Otterburn sits in Benton County and Tippecanoe County, um, all along in all of my planning, I thought that I would just have to go to Benton County Council because that's who I go through for budget, uh, for binding review or something, that's who I would go through. Um, but with parcel counts and, and uh, going through the, the process that Kristen just mentioned, um, we found out that I had to go to Benton and Tippecanoe. Um, my biggest piece of advice is to start relationships and communication early with your county councils or whoever your fiscal body is. And I had done that with Benton County 
but I hadn't done that with Tippecanoe County because I really didn't know I would ever have to go to Tippecanoe County. So that was a bit of a surprise. So be sure you know who your fiscal bodies are. <laughs> The other thing is that um, even though like the town council, um, even though you might not need their approval, it's good to form some positive relationships with them because my town council ended up being opposed to the project. And had I educated them earlier or communicated them about the project earlier, I don't think that there would have been opposition because a lot of that has turned around as uh, the education piece has happened over the last year. Um, but I wish I would have known to talk to them first. I wish, you know, this is, this is where Kristen asks people, what, what do you wish you would have known? And that's one of the things I wish I would have known is to have better relationships and better communication with all the people that will be involved. And um, also knowing what's going on in your community. Um, <clears throat> Like one of, the, one of the pieces that we had in our community, community was a referendum that had just passed with their local school board. Um, so our taxpayers were very tax sensitive. And so they were all concerned about what our project was going to do to their tax rate and if it was going to have the same impact as the school referendum did. So kind of know what's going on in your community and be aware of all those, all those things and all those people that are involved. Sarah, what about you and your planning process? Okay, so I took this position and we had two years left of our current bond. And thankfully I sat in on an ice miller presentation and realized, oh, you have to start planning one to two years before you actually get your bond or actually need your bond. Um, so I went and found Ryan Fetters from what's now Baker Tilly at the time and had him kind of in on what our goals were. And he was, you know, let us know the parcel who we needed to go to for approval um, and how the timeline worked with getting a bond um, two years before we even tried to get our bond. So I'm really glad that I sat in first on that presentation and knew to um, to start that early. And then we also contacted the architect we wanted to work with at the time and did kind of a master plan. So we had just went through our long range plan and everybody was talking about building, building, building. And so we contacted the architect, did a long range plan with all of our wants and wishes and goals um, so that we had floor plan and um, assumed amounts for Ryan to work with with Baker Tilly before we even went to our council. Um, so that, I think that was kind of the eye opener that it's not just, oh, hey, we wanna apply for a bond and like a grant, you just fill out an application and you get it. Like it, it's a one to two year process of trying to make sure you're asking for the right amount. Cause that's the other thing that's gonna upset whatever council or board you go to. If at first you think your project's only going to be a million, and then after you go through the planning, you're like, well, actually, we need three million. <laughs> they're like, well, we already approved you for a million. Why are you coming back for two million? And they're going to look at you as if um, you're maybe not taking it seriously enough or you're not planning through the process um, with good intentions of spending tax dollars. So, so Sarah, talk for a minute about so you started two years out in part because you had a bond issue paying off. That mm -hmm. tax rate management, was that also important to understand before you went? Yes, yeah, so that was the biggest reason why we started that early um, because of how our old bond was going to fall off, the tax rate would have actually dipped and then it would have went back up again when our new bond came on. So we, we did a lot of um, orchestration with that with Ryan to make sure that um, one bond was kind of coming off as the other one came on and that the tax rate remained the same for taxpayers. And then that way, when we went to the council, we could say, we're not raising the tax rate. We're not, you know, we're keeping it, we're keeping it the same. Um, 
they also had the counter argument. They're like, yeah, but you're not letting the tax rate drop. And it's like, well, of course not, because we've been approved to have this money in our budget. So um, don't let them tell you that it's not your right to have that bond and to renew it. But right. Kristen, we do have a question that kind of falls in line with this that uh-huh. just came in. How early is too early to contact Ice Miller to get things going to rebond? You know, honestly, I don't think it's ever too early um, in part because even if you think that you have a project your board's considering that you may be able to afford in the next five years, it's still important to know what the law is today and who your elected body would be today. And I say today because you all know every April they mess with our statutes. But the reason it's really important are because of the relationships you need to form in the politics. So it's never too early. And that's actually, thanks, Laura, and thank you for the question, because that's actually a great segue into one of the other most important topics, which Letitia and Sarah did an amazing job on this, which is that relationship in politic piece that you really do need to be aware of. And again, you can never start soon enough. So Letitia, do you want to talk about what that means to you and what you did in Otterbin? Um, Yes, thankfully, um, I am going on my fifth year here at Otterbin at the public library. Um, And early on, um, I I went through an Ice Miller uh, webinar or something as well. And so I knew somewhere in there, it talked about the relationship with your county council. And that's when I started building my relationship. Um, I got on the agenda and started doing library updates. Um, so so that I felt that I wanted my county council to know that I was being fiscally responsible with the money that they were entrusting to me as, as a director. Um, we also have six libraries in our county and I wanted to make sure that they knew that I was doing my job. I wanted, uh, if there was gonna be you know, any chance of consolidations in the future or any chance of, um, you know, them giving funding to one library over another, I wanted them to know who we were and what we were doing. And so I just felt that I needed to build that relationship. So not only did I go to their meetings, um, I did it about quarterly uh, and just did library updates and let them know what our library was doing. But I also sent out newsletters every month um, to be distributed to all the county council members and the county um, commissioners. Um, and then I also built, um, just individual relationships with them. Um, some of them I have working relationships with you, like one of them happens to be my insurance agent for the library. So he knows what we do from that standpoint. Um, and then another big piece was, uh, inviting them to all your events. Uh, if you're having some sort of like we had a 100 year celebration, be sure and invite them, you know, make sure that you have a a specific invitation that goes out to those county councilmen and make sure that they're coming uh, to your to your events. Um, A lot of them don't know what's going on, um, especially if they live in a nearby town, they might not, you know, know exactly what's going on in the county. So be sure you're always just um, building trust with them and letting them know what your library is doing. And also, it's also important to know what they're doing too. I mean, when you sit in on the meetings, you know, you see how they distribute the money and how, how they, how many people are coming to them on a regular basis wanting more funding for different projects or different things. So it's important to know what's going on in your community as well. So Letitia, you attended every, like every monthly meeting, but presented quarterly. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then sent out also just a summary of what the library was doing. Was that monthly or quarterly or just? Um, Monthly, I did the newsletters. Um, But once again, I only did this with Benton County Council. I did not know to do any of this with Tippecanoe County Council. So I wish I would have done the same things for Tippecanoe County Council. I wish I would have done the same things for my town council, even though that they didn't have to approve. It would have been good for them to know what we do on a regular basis, because that's been like a 
you know, backpedaling type of thing I've had to do is educate the other entities that were involved. So. Sarah, what about you with your relationship in politics? What advice? <laughs> <laughs> so um, we were always kind of told, lay low, don't let them know what you're doing and they won't try and take your money from you. And that is not the right approach to take. So um, I was obviously very new. I had only been in this position for uh, less than two years. And we did, during our long range plan, we did invite one county council member to be on all the meetings. And then we invited him on all of the smaller meetings on the master plan for the architecture and all of that. And so we thought, hey, we have county council representative and he's gonna communicate back to the rest of the group. And we realized because we didn't know them personally, we picked the odd man out um, who was the, probably we picked him because he was the only one that actually used the library and actually had a library card um, that has since changed, which is good. But uh, so that's why we picked him. And then we found out because he was cutting the on man out, he wasn't really telling them anything. And so when we sat down to talk about maybe what, a month out from the vote that, hey, we're going to ask for this bond and this is the project and why and everything, they're all kind of like, oh, um, we don't really know anything about this and we have other things that we want to do. And there, so there's just a lot of confusion. Like they felt like we kind of sideswiped them with this giant ask for funds. And there was someone on my county council who it wouldn't have mattered what I did. He didn't like libraries and he didn't like us. So, and unfortunately he was kind of the, one of the key people so I don't know if involving him ahead of time would have helped or not, or if he just was that stubborn. So, so Sarah, because you are in a countywide district, yes. how important it, was it for you to make the connection with your township representative? Like, so where you're located in your city town? Um, our city didn't really, um, they weren't really all that bothered. Our mayor was on board, um, the city council was on board because they saw the benefit of what it would do for the city. Um, it's mostly, it was mostly our county that kind of struggled with, with the concept of, well, the, the building's good enough, why do you need more funds, so. So I think that's a good leeway, Sarah, into our next topic, which is like education and how do you educate your elected board on libraries and a bond issue. Um, what, how did you educate your members or what are some things that would be helpful for these other directors to know about to prepare? <laughs> uh, well, first off, they thought, because um, Baker Tilly does this, you know, what your max to bond would be, which was more money than we would ever need. I think our max was like 9 million or something. And so they, they read through that report and they thought they meant that was the max for the county. And so they thought, oh, well, but if we give you three and we need to update the jail and then we need to update the highway garage, we won't have enough to do what we want to do because the max for the county is 9 million. And so we had to kind of re-educate, no, that max is what the library has the potential to bond for. Um, and that doesn't affect you. You have that potential to bond that much for each of those entities that they're talking about. Uh, so that was kind of the education on the, the financial side that we kind of went back and forth, back and forth. A lot of times they were kind of like, why are you even, why are you even here? You know, and so you had to explain, well, it's because we're an elected board and or we're, you're the elected board, we're an appointed board. Um, and then the other thing was, a lot of them, because they aren't library users, they don't have library cards, they no longer have young children, they are still thinking of libraries as they were when they went to school. So it's just this big giant building full of books. And they're like, well, I don't understand why you need, um, why you need this seating. I even had one guy ask me why we needed more outlets because people just come in to check books out. And it's like, well, no, so it's kind of that re-education as well as, you know, we're a third place. We provide 
um, places for people to build community. We provide um, second offices for those that work from home. You know, we provide a place for teenagers to hang out at the end of the day. Homeschooling parents use our study rooms um, and, you know, Wi-Fi as well. That was, <laughs> we wanted to put um, kind of charging posts outside so people could even sit on benches, charge their devices and use the wireless. And they're like, well, you're already providing free Wi-Fi. I don't know why you have to provide more free electricity. So I, it was just kind of re-educating what libraries are today versus maybe what they were, you know, 20 years ago when they would have been in school. And I even had a county council member actually go to Allen County and just pick the minds of the librarians there. So I don't know who he talked to, but thank you if you're listening. <laughs> so you did a good job of backing up everything that I had said with them about um, the need for the changes of libraries. But I think, does that count? I think that kind of covers everything. So those key areas that Sarah just talked about, like educating them about what a library does today and how impactful you are to your community, even though you know what the library does, mm -hmm. it's so important to educate others on what you do, especially, you know, we've talked a lot in county council meetings lately about uh, parental visitations in libraries. Yes. In yeah, that was... Yeah, that was one reason why we wanted to add a study room in our children's room um, because, you know, supervised visits, they have to provide a meal and we don't want them just doing that out in the middle of nowhere. And we're like, so they can, you know, not only are they just using it for tutoring or, you know, e-learning, um, they can also provide that meal then in that study room and they clean up and then they observe the parent um, out in the building. So, yeah. In addition to those topics that you all work every day and are, are your passion and how you impact your community and the people in it, as we dig into potential projects, there are also, also these fact-specific situational educational pieces. In Letitia, in your project, your education was not only about what does my library do, but you also had the situational education. Can you kind of explain that and how that may come up for these other directors? Um, so like Sarah, um, I knew that my bond was uh, you know, coming up and that I would have to um, go into either another project or, or pay it off. And we wanted to go into another project. Um, but I was told by previous board members and townspeople, you know, that were here before I was here, that this building was always built to have a second floor. Um, this is where Sarah's point of having an architect on board at, at the same time you have Ice Miller and Baker Tilly and, and all of the team together, an architect is extremely important to get them on board because I was told by townspeople um, but I hadn't consulted with an architect. So by the time I consulted an architect, they told me we did not have the structure or the ability to have a second floor. So there goes my project. You know, what do you do when you, when you don't have what you've been planning on and what you've been educating your board on for the last four years? Um, so fortunately, we had the opportunity to purchase a building that is just to the north of us that was used to be a gas station and an automotive repair shop and those kind of things, um, <clears throat> which then brought a whole new education piece uh, to the table that I had no idea I would have to learn about. Um, but it is something that other libraries have had to go through and something that you as a library may have to go through if you're purchasing another property. Um, and that's learning all the things about that property. And so um, I found out that there were tanks that, uh, gas tanks that were still underground that needed to be um, removed. Um, so there was a whole, so there's the term brownfield that I had never heard before, but that's what this property was. Um, which then comes a whole new um, variety of issues that you're going through in your building project. Um, so with this being a brownfield, uh, what, does the, what does that do for the community if you're going to purchase this, pro purchase this property and 
um, what's it gonna do for the community? Um, and ours, our piece of that was the environmental cleanup part of it. Um, so I um, was able to work on getting a grant or a couple grant, grants um, for the remediation of the property uh, through IDM. And um, so it's, they are removing the tanks and the um, soil that is contaminated. Um, so we not only have an environmental cleanup for our town, the whole corner is going to have a beautification aspect to it. Um, we now will be able to add on to our uh, library and add more space with specific purposes. Um, and we're adding parking, which is a tremendous problem in our town. So we are gonna be adding a parking lot where the building stood before. Um, we did get a, a lot of uh, pushback from the community um, about this being a historical building, even though it is a um, somewhat of an eyesore and a and a you know environmental issue, a, a hazard to the community, you know, a, an unused building that has just been mostly used for storage, um, and now it's going to be a purposeful corner on a main intersection in our town. Um, but the history behind it is still a big aspect for people. So um, with the opposition, with them saying that it's a historical building and here's the you know horrible library director coming in and uh, tearing mm -hmm. it down to add on to a library that people don't have the education and understanding of why you even need more space, like Sarah was discussing about the educational piece. Um, then you have to work on the education piece of what are what are the next 20 years for a library going to look like and and what kind of things is that space going to be used for. Um, and that's where you as a director kind of need to educate yourself on what does the next 20 years look like. Um, and especially where you're sitting, you know what can you offer in your communities that. Um, may not be being offered um, and you know even simple things like we're adding parking that is a big thing to this to this community um, and all the things that Sarah talked about that the space can provide in your library so um, the other area that I just wanted to mention too um, is the when we went to the county councils, how our community didn't understand why we had to go to them. Um, we were the first library in our county uh, that had to go to county council for approval for a project like this. Um, so in some ways, you know, like Sarah had said, uh, they were told to fly under the radar and not draw very much attention to. Um, this was kind of a place where we kind of needed to fly under the radar a little bit because less was more in this respect. Um, their, their feelings were that this was, um, you know, money that, that was ours anyway, that we could tap into anyway. So they didn't really have opposition at, in that respect. So there was no reason to complicate the situation and, and go into more than needed to be said in that educational piece. Um, so sometimes just knowing where your county council is um, with, with that aspect, um, you know, sometimes less is more. And in our, um, in our situation, less was more in one county. <laughs> um, so, but we also took the preliminary drawings so that they could see what the architects were thinking about our project and what that beautification was going to look like and what that parking lot was gonna look like and what that um, corner was gonna look like without that building and without that environmental piece. Um, so that education part was more important to them, the Indiana code or the statutes. Um, they wanted to see what the results were gonna be, what it was going to do for our community. Um, Tippecanoe County was um, needed 
probably even less than Benton County because they were more familiar with it and they do have more libraries in their area that they come to them for this approval. So they understood that piece of it already and we didn't have to educate them on that. So just know your fiscal bodies. <laughs> That's, that's again why the relationships and the politics are so important. So, and I know you both were very different in how we had to approach it because of what we learned through the multiple conversations. And in Sarah's case, um, we kept getting tabled. So our yes. approval, how many times did we get tabled? Three or four? Um, yeah, I think three. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so when when we were going through this process and a lot, I mean, we get started early so we can go through these things that Letitia and Sarah are talking about. We can know who your board uh, approving elected board is, but the other piece is how do I present this to county council? I mean, for those of you who have been attending the meetings like Letitia discussed, you know, it's very formal. You kind of have to ask to be on the agenda if you're going to present and then a lot of the presentations you will see are more for the county level. So are more for those garages or roads and bridges. And so you don't always get to see what's presented. So I wanted to spend some time, Sarah, I'll start off with you talking about how did you and what did you present to the council when you went for our bond approval? Right, so the first meeting, we sat down with them in groups of three so that they didn't have a quorum um, and kind of presented everything, our plans, the cost, you know, and all of that. And they really were um, quite responsive. They, they seemed like there wasn't going to be a problem. They didn't have any questions. Um, and then we got to the meeting and it was just kind of silence. Like we presented everything that we just talked to them two weeks ago and they just were like, well, I think we're going to need to table this and think about this a little further. And we, we all just kind of left going, what, what has happened in two weeks that all of a sudden they're all kind of like, well, I'm just not sure. Um, and we found out it was they wanted to update the jail and they wanted to update um, the highway garage. And one member, I think, wanted to try and take our bond money and apply it to those projects. Again, not quite understanding how the process works, that that probably wasn't going to happen that way. Um, but so we kind of left that and we thought, OK, we have a month. And then um, a couple of days after that, a few of the members called. And one of them basically just told me what the concerns were that they just weren't sure about the funds now and they have all these other projects um, and they just don't really see the need because we're, we're doing okay where these other two buildings, they, they have a need and they do this for the community and that for the community. Um, and so we all were just kind of like, okay, we have a month to let them know what we do and why we're such a need um, in the community and why, the changes we're requesting are um, changes that were requested of us from our community. So we actually put together a binder. We contacted key people all throughout um, um, the community as well as patrons. They wrote letters, they made phone calls. Um, we had a binder that included a, an infographic of all the different stats of what we did within one year. And we had, let's see, our timeline of all the different public planning meetings so that they know that we didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, I'd like a really bougie office. So let's apply for a $3 million bond because um, that's kind of what they were accusing us of. And so that it was the community that was calling and, and demanding that this bond go through. The second meeting, we told them, we don't think you're gonna have enough space um, you can use the library. That's usually what they use when there's um, too large of a crowd for their space and they waited too long and they didn't. And so then we were tabled again. Um, and then we finally met um, a third time in the library, which is never used no, um, for the project. And we had all of that. We even had somebody write this like dissertation letter of all these questions about the things that our money could be used for in the community other than that. 
So we answered that. One of the biggest things was return on investment. He was saying that we pump all these tax dollars into our libraries and there's no return on investment. Like the, the nobody uses the library anymore. Nobody this and everything. And so thankfully Zach Benedict, our architect at the time, let me know about ALA's um, return on investment calculator for libraries. Um, it's no longer on their website. They've moved it to a different website, but I'm gonna put it in the chat. And it's just, um, I love, li uh, love libraries.org, what libraries do calculator. And what's really great about this site was that I could put in, um, how many books are checked out, what we do for programming, how many people come in the building and they take an average cost of what that would be if the person actually paid for the book themselves and what the, if the person paid a membership to come to the library and they give you your return on investment. And I think by the end of it, our return on investment was like over 200% um, return on investment. So we could kind of um, defunct that argument that you know you pump all these tax dollars into the library and we return nothing out for the community and so yeah it was, it was a very thick binder we made one we gave them digital copies through email of all of them we gave them physical copies that had um, even the physical letters that people wrote in the binder and then we invited people to show up and people weren't actually allowed to talk, like it wasn't a public hearing. So just to show support, because they could have claimed that all the people in the audience were equally against it. When I stood up to give the art presentation, I just said, those of you that are here in support of the library's bond project, please stand up. And I think all but maybe, what, seven people of the over hundred people that were in the room all stood up. And so it was just kind of that physical um, visual for our county council members that are all standing there and their constituents um, who were going to be electing or not electing them within the next year could um, actually stand up and show them, yeah, we're in support of this. And you probably just lost over a hundred votes if you vote against it, so. So again, your summary goes back to why it's never too early to start. Yes. Talking. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, you who you're going to go to. And we know you've been to meetings, you've been forming these relationships, you know, they have a real issue with libraries or, you know, they don't come. Mm -hmm. in. You can start putting those binders, gathering that information because you all had to do it in a couple. We weeks. did it. Yeah, we did it in, in a couple weeks. And, yeah. um, yeah, it was, that was a fun time. And they kept firing us with emails with different questions they had thought of. Well, what about this? Well, what all did you use? Did you only use bond money on the last project? How much of it was Lurf and Rainy Day? And so we had to, you know, just kind of prove to them that we don't do it just on bonds. We had used Lurf and Rainy Day, the last one. We were going to use Lurf and Rainy Day on this one. So, um, yeah, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I, I always tell my directors at the beginning, you know, I work in Marion County and I live in Putnam County. And so I feel like I have the best of both worlds, a big town, a small town. And I always say there is nobody that can learn or know your community like you do. And so when Letitia and I first started having these calls, we had that same discussion. I told her about everything Sarah just talked about. It's often important to get these binders together. It's often important to make sure, you know, they know what the library does, et cetera. So Letitia, you know, you talked a little bit about less is more, but how did you know that? How did you know that your presentation didn't need to be like Sarah's? Um, I have a relationship with our auditor in the county and I had in, in my relationship building, um, there's other key people in the community. And so my auditor is in charge of the scheduling and sh for, for all the county council meetings. Um, she, is, uh, she is the communication uh, bridge between the county council and anyone who wanna, wants to get to the county council. Um, so she's, the, she, she's like the key component there for that. 
Um, but then I also, you know, with the relationships that I had with the county council, uh, I had several of them come to me individually to, to ask questions, to find out uh, what we were doing and how we were going to do it and why we were doing it. Um, and it was those individual discussions, I think, that helped us, you know, pass things on the first go around and didn't have to go back three times like Sarah did. I'm so glad that we didn't get tabled um, because honestly, we didn't have time to get tabled. Our timeline has been so tight um, because of having to change projects and wait to buy a building and wait to remediate land and uh, dem dem demolish a building. You know, there's so many pieces and aspects that we didn't have time for it to be tabled. So I'm so thankful that those relationships did help uh, things go more smoothly in the county council meetings. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention too is that I didn't just stop with, with county councils or town councils. Uh, I spoke to Rotary. I spoke to my um, Otterburn Alumni Association. Uh, I spoke to American Legion, like any groups of you know, 10, 20, 30 people. Uh, I was speaking to them and I was presenting to them and I was sharing with them what our plans were. Um, it's better to have them out there spreading the truth about what's going on rather than spreading mm -hmm. rumors about what, what we're going to do to them, you know, by taking their tax money or using it inappropriately or, um, you know, just all the rumors that fly when a project like this is on the table. Um, so just squash those rumors and get the truth out there. Um, the last thing I have done is I did all the things that Sarah did. I put together a binder. Um, I did research on what things are going to be needed and how relevant libraries are going to be over the next 20 years. And I put all of those things in my binder. Um, I got the letters of support. And then we just recently had a, um, because I'm still going through this <laughs> project. <laughs> um, I recently had like a, t like almost like a town hall meeting um, and had everybody come out that still had questions or still wanted to know more about the project. And we had all of those letters out there for them to see. We had the progression of what our library has looked like from a little one room reading room in 1898 to uh, then a little small brick building in 1904 or whatever. And, and then what it looked like uh, 20 years ago when this building was built and the other one was um, replaced. And so to show them the progression you know, of time, change is hard for people. And to let them know that every time we have survived and we've become better and we've been able to offer more to our communities. I just... I think it was a, a key component. Um, the other thing when you're, uh, when you're talking to any of these, I had a reporter that um, that's another good relationship um, is to be good and with the, with the public in that way. Um, I've been on TV 18 now. I've been in the local newspapers. Um, there's been articles written up about all of our projects all of our stuff that's going on. Um, so getting the truth out there in, in that regard as, as well. But one of the things that the reporter told me was um, to always start out with like the statistics. So like all the numbers that Sarah was talking about um, with that ilovelibraries.org, start with the statistics, you know, like what, what's your circulation like? What's your programs like? What are you offering to people? And those numbers stick with people. I, I still have sometimes somebody say, I just still can't believe that you had, you know, 14,000 circulations and, you know, whatever. So the numbers kind of stick with people. So put those st statistics out there for people. And I know we only have a few minutes um, before we take questions, but I, I wanted to kind of bring us all back together to talk about the timing of the approval. The other reason, and you'll keep hearing me say this over and over again, start as early as you can. The other reason is frankly where Letitia sits right now is that she has, her debt is rolling off so we need to sell bonds this year. She needs to be able to have a debt service levy in her budget for this year. 
So we were blessed to get through the council approvals, um, but then we found out the Brownsfield issue after we had modified. So again, you always, you'll never start too early. The other issue is, is that we do not want to do any legal work. We do not want you to pay an architect for detailed drawings until you have been through your elected board approval. Because Sarah and Letitia are here today talking to you about great, not great experiences, but their experiences where they got approval. There's many more we've worked with that we don't get approval or we have to delay the project for a year or two. So we really focus at Ice Miller on walking with you through this journey, helping you through the process, but also we focus on the elected board approval before you start any of your local board approvals, just to keep those costs down. Because we all know that libraries struggle, whether you're in a construction project or not with operations. So when you're planning, again, reach out early, reach out often. Um, and I think Laura, I'll open it up unless Letitia or Sarah, you have anything else, open it up for questions. Yes, this has been wonderful. So many great uh, ideas and I've been taking lots of notes too. All right. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to put those in the chat and we'll get those to the presenters. Looks like our first question came in. How do you go about demolishing a building? Who do I need to talk to? So that's, that's hard. Um, first, it's going to generally cost money to demolish. Um, there's a lot of local ordinances. If you have a local council, I would start there. I think Letitia, uh, your local council really helped with yes. your demolition, not only with the Brownsfield issue, um, but about the historical issue, about the negotiations, um, how it was bid. So I would definitely start with your local council on demolition if you can afford to pay for it from Lure for Rainy Day. If you have to borrow money to demolish and your ultimate goal is to either build on an addition or do something with the place that you demolished, even if it's a parking lot, um, you would need to talk to your local council before you start and then you would need to bring in your bond council. Can I add something to that? Yes, please. Um, also look into grants um, when, and, and that's another relationship piece, because if you talk to your town ahead of time, if you know that there's going to be a building that needs to be demolished uh, with town support, they could apply for an OCRA grant for you for a blight, um, what's it called, blight something um, demolition. So you might be able to get grants out there. So um, keep your eye on grants. Uh, time was of the, of the essence for us, so we weren't able to get one. Um, and they did shut those down during COVID. But if you if you work on those ahead of time, you might be able to get a grant for that demolition. Okay, thank you. Looks like I'm just waiting to see if we have any more questions here. So if you have them, please feel free to put them in the chat. And Julie says, I have found that I had to educate my county council on things that I assumed they knew. In Julie, in your situation too, um, that county council was the most formal county council we had ever been through. So in addition to Julie having to educate them on why they had to approve, we also had to time it perfectly because before you could go um, in Julie's county, you actually had to petition and show up the month before and then go. So you're right, Julie, we did. And you had the one representative, Chris, I think was his name from your township, um, who really talked to Julie behind the scenes too, and really tried to, she educated him and yeah, Christian. And then he educated the rest of the county. Looks like we have another question. How do you even start a debt service account? You don't need a debt service fund until you have debt to repay. So I'm trying to think, I don't think anybody I'm working with right now. Um, so if you have, that must mean that you have no debt, Stephanie, um, or debt payable from your debt service fund. So when the bonds are issued to finance the renovations, improvement or construction, 
your um, financial advisor, your municipal advisor will tell you how to open that fund, but you won't have one open and it will not be audited by State Board of Accounts or DLGF until you have a bond issue that you have to repay. Okay, I'm going to put the uh, form in the chat so you can request your LEU. And if there's any more questions, feel free to put those in now. Wait a minute or so here. And I guess while we wait for any more questions too, Laura, um, there are many libraries we work with. We always go through the same process where we talk about the politics, the education, who is your elected uh, body to approve. But there are some, and I always hold my breath, that get through right away. I didn't choose Letitia and Sarah to help me with this because their situations were difficult. I really wanted you to see the preparation that it takes to get approval in general. And they both prepared unbelievably so to get through, but there are times, especially if you're within the confines of your city or town where those people visit your library all the time and you've been talking to them about it for years, it may be an easier process for you. But no matter what process it will be, we always walk through the same facts, the same questions that we all talked about with you today. Awesome, looks like we're getting some comments, excellent presentation and thank you all for for presenting today. This was wonderful, very informative. And if you want to go ahead and stop the recording, Lisa.